everyone, and I hope that you've just really enjoyed that wonderful talk by Dr. Mark Forrest just now. Um, for some of you, um, your questions were answered during the live uh, session in Conway Hall, but we're going to be answering some of the questions online as well. Just a reminder, if you do have any questions that you want to ask Mark, please make sure to put them in the Q&A section of the webinar. I'm going to be looking down at my laptop here to answer your questions. I have made notes of some of the ones that were in the chat, but um, if we can try and make sure as much as possible that they are in the Q&A, that would be amazing. And once again, thank you so much, Mark. We've had so many comments in our chat saying how amazing the talk was, lots of food for thought and lots of local history research as a result. So that's what we want, <laughs> more local history research in manorial documents. Absolutely. Um, and also, just as a reminder, sorry if you can hear sound from the hall, there is a video playing on our live stream, which is on YouTube, uh, which is for the AGM that is going on concurrently. Just a reminder, this is a hybrid event with lots of different things going on, so do bear with us. But the first question, and um, when Mark and I were chatting just off uh, camera just now, he was very excited to see uh, this person in the chat. So Trixie Gad said, thank you for the great talk. I'd like to know whether manorial, borough or parochial officers were all drawn from the same pool of inhabitants and did the different jurisdictions come into conflict? Now, she is from your local area, isn't she? She is, yeah, yeah, Dorset person doing Dorset research. So uh, fantastic. I'd yeah, be very, very yeah. pleased to have people researching. Dorset and I think probably Hampshire as well. Um, yeah, manorial um, parish and borough offices sometimes do come from the same pool and sometimes they don't. It's a bit tricky, it depends on uh, the area that you're looking at. Uh, I think probably the best research that's been done on this is Marjorie McIntosh's book on the Royal Manor of Havering. Um, Margaret Spufford's book, Contrasting Communities, has some pretty good material too, where people have looked at the different pools of officers and seen whether they're part of the manorial administration and how they hold their land and what the property holding qualifications are for different types of officers. Um, certainly at Havering, I think the, the, the borough officers and the manorial officers are probably quite distinct in Essex. Um, so they're the same type of people quite often uh, at, at the top end that uh, they're the people who you'd expect to be church wardens um the people you'd expect to be managing the local community they have enough status to be able to do that in many of the manorial offices that's true uh, but in some manorial offices some manorial offices don't carry a lot of status some of the manorial offices like Haywood, um, uh, Scavenger, uh, not very much status there at all, if any. In fact, it's probably a job that you have to pay people to do. So there's a, there's a wide range of manorial offices, the, the ones that uh, you would expect to overlap with a borough elite might be perhaps the jurors in a court elite. Um, or, uh, the assessors are fine, but 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 the um, the more onerous work you might think would be attached to a particular land holding, and it would go around in a rotation, and people wouldn't necessarily particularly want to do it. It could be an onerous task; they wouldn't enjoy it. They might even employ a surrogate to do it. So so, so there's, there's variation, but but there is some overlap. Excellent. Okay. That's amazing. And I can see that Joyce is just about to join um, the uh, AGM as well. So I will ask this question now from her. Uh, but were many manners mixed? Um, so for example, urban and rural. And she also asked, will county record offices in Cheshire let her know where her manor is in Warrington? Okay, I think, I think we answered the Cheshire and Warrington section uh, out in the hall. Um, but mixed manners, yes. Um, there is some overlap between urban and rural manners. Um, there are some manners that are entirely urban, the manner of the Savoy in London, I think it's often held up as a classic example of that, but there are also manners which overlap and, ha and have a, either a majority urban area with a rural hinterland, uh, or are principally rural, but then little pockets within an urban area as well. So, but this is true of all manners, really, that they can be very 
Manners don't have to be like the map of Chalbury that I showed as the second slide where everything was in, within one border. Manners can perm into each other that several manners could have shares of a common field or several manners could have share of common meadow or woodland and particularly downland. So that, that's also true with the manners that have a, an urban element that they can, that they can perm mix in um, to another administration, be that another manor or a borough. Excellent. And then with um, M. Lawrence Owen, and I think that was Miranda earlier, so apologies if I've not said that. Um, so what exactly was each copyhold tenant given? And presumably that would be only a copy of the section of role relating to their holdings. Yes, that's right. Um, just the copy of the section of role relating to their holdings. Um, the court role itself would record uh, often actually not as much detail as the copy of court role. It would include the name of the Lords of Manor, the name of the steward, the date at which the copy was granted, the tenant who was incoming, whose life was uh, to start the copyhold, his tenancy for life, and then the other um, people, usually his children, nieces, nephews, brothers, who, who could be named on the copy, so it can be men and women. Uh, and it would give a brief outline of the property itself. Um, sometimes naming particular closes or fields, but not going so far as to name individual strips within fields. Um, it would be assumed that that copy would be recognisable from the most recent rental or survey. Um, and it would be assumed that the customs of the manor were known to the tenants and known to the jurors and the homage, so that uh, it wasn't necessary to put them into the copyhold agreement. Now, copyhold agreements can be very useful because they often survive where manor court rules have been lost. So I'm thinking of a manor like uh, Broadmain in Dorset, where there are no manor court rolls at all. No court rolls, no books, we've got no record of the court in session. But we've got two or three hundred copyhold agreements. And from those copyhold agreements, we can reconstruct uh, the pattern of tenancy and a lot of the uh, 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 setup of the manor. The, 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 the fields and woods, the closest where they were, who held them at different times, because there will be enough information in those copyhold agreements to kind of know who's adjacent to who and who's land butts on to something else. Excellent. And then we found this question quite interesting as well, Suffolk, I think it was. Um, so Lynn Boothman said, I've used records from the later 17th century through to the 19th in a Suffolk manner. I've been interested in the growth of conditional surrenders where the property is being used for short term loans. I'd be mm -hmm. interested to know if this is common elsewhere. It's an interesting way of getting credit. It is an interesting way of getting credit. It does happen elsewhere. How common it is, I don't know. I haven't, I haven't read anything on that. I haven't seen anybody else's study relating to that. Um, in Suffolk, I mean, there, there, there are that there's good work on Suffolk. I already um, talked about Margaret Kim Sarcher and Margaret Spufford. Um, we we'll had uh, Richard Hoyle and uh, Henry French's work on Earl's Colm in Essex. So that uh, has been work within that area. I would have thought that Henry French and Richard Hoyle would be likely to pick that up if it had happened in Essex. Um, it's certainly the case that increasingly from late 16th century onwards, more and more property speculators invest in copyhold land, more and more urban merchants um, build up a property portfolio, if you like, so they've got land as security. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if that wasn't happening elsewhere, uh, but it's not something I've looked at myself. Maybe that's something for some of something our for more, more to study. Do. Yeah, there's yeah. So, so much in manorial records that there's just nothing published about it. So, so almost any area that you pick, the, 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 you can be doing the, the, the definitive, the, the type article 
that people would then refer back to because it's the only article on that subject. So, so yeah. groundbreaking, groundbreaking research. <laughs> yeah, it really is. So many aspects of the oral history of life. Definitely. And I believe that we might have answered this already in the hall, but um, Colette Miles said, was there a conflict between court and vestry? So, for example, regarding the uses of resources for the poor? Regarding the use of resources for the poor, not necessarily, because the, um, the Manor Court has quite prescribed areas of interest and the vestry has quite prescribed areas of interest. And I don't think could be wrong, but I, I don't think that there's likely to be a conflict between them. But what's certainly the case is that the church wardens um, and therefore available to the, the church within the parish um, are, are parts of the manor that are designated as fields uh, for the upkeep of the port. So, so you will quite frequently find that within the manor court there's a piece of land that is held by the church wardens rather than being held by a tenant as an individual. Um, within a conflict between the vestry and uh, the court would be more likely to occur over jurisdiction. And, uh, and I think the, the question in the hall um, really related to the changing role of the manor court leads and the changing role of the vestry and the vestry becoming a more important organisation over time as the court leads became less important. And, and that's certainly the case um, across most of the country and, 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 it's rate, and that rate of change, how that happens and when that happens, again, is, a, is an interesting area because it doesn't happen at the same rate everywhere and it can be centuries apart. Um, on, manners and parishes that aren't geographically very far apart. Wow, that sounds amazing. I'm learning so much about these oh, records, I kind of want to look at them myself now. <laughs> um, so Phoebe Merrick has said, here in Romsey, the records of those eligible for jury service for the three town tithings survive in the Broadlands collection in the University of Southampton for the later 17th and 18th century. I've not met other examples of this, so do they survive elsewhere? Records of people available for jury service. I haven't come across a document that specifically has that heading, but what you do find, I think called resident roles, um, which are essentially people who are resident within the manor. Um, so that could be an equivalent form of document. Those people who are within the manor are, are the residents, in other words, resident really. Um, and, and resident resident roles is a, a, a classification of manorial document which can be searched for on the manorial document register. So I would say that's uh, the most likely equivalent. Lists of jurors, they may well exist elsewhere. Uh, I don't think I can recall seeing them. Um, so Susan Rose has also said, in my parish in Devon, uh, we have a farm now called Court Barton, early, earlier known just as Court. My theory that is that this was where manor courts were held. Is that likely? Uh, it's quite possible. Yep, 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 the name is for that. It could be where the manor courts were held. It could be where the a manorial court, court house, a manor house was located. Um, the site of the manor, um, either an area where the lord of the manor lived or an area where his principal salaried officer, somebody like a bailiff, lived at uh, essentially a home farm. It's, it sounds to me like it's the site of a, a, a home farm which could hold a court, which could, because it's got the word court in the title, most likely did hold a court. Um, I think if I can just kind of go off at a tangent from yeah. that, that people often think of manors as having manor houses. Um, if you, I know if I go out in Dorset and I talk to local WI, I say, oh, you know, what's my house, a manor house? I say, well, manor houses didn't exist on every manor because if a manor was owned by the crown or if a manor was owned by the local monastery it wasn't necessary to have a manor house they didn't need to have a house in every manor they had. Um, so and similarly for lots of um, larger estates 
multiple manors, you don't need to have a house in one, but you usually have some kind of home farm, at least in the Middle Ages. And these are quite often worked in hand as part of the estate by salaried officers of the Lord of the Manor up until, say, the start of the 13th century. And then they could be, and they were retained as an area known as the Demean uh, well after that. And, and it could well be that what you've got there is, is a site that had been part of that principal home farm area. Again, one of these interesting things from 1500 onwards, from 1500 to 1900, is how that broke up. When the domain breaks up, that often produces a lot of leasehold land um, that gets put into the property market in the manner for tenants to acquire and augment their holdings or hold instead of copyhold land. So it produces a dual system within parish. We've got some leasehold, some copyhold. The leasehold being the old home farm, the old domain, and the copyhold being the land that was held by the sort of villain tenants, the serfs in the early Middle Ages. So there's a lot going on there that you can find from the name of a particular place. And I, yeah, I, I, I think it's quite conceivable that the court and the court barton is the site of an original manor court. You are, you are absolutely <laughs> right with your assumption, which is wonderful. Um, so Richard Neely has said, in the court leaks we've been studying, it's fairly common for leaseholders to be fined for not appearing. Was this a serious offence, or did people prefer to pay the fine rather than turn up? And how important was it to turn up? It depends. Leaseholders often don't have quite as many rights as the customary tenants. And leaseholders often usually can't serve uh, as part of the homage. So it's restricted to customary tenants in most manners, not necessarily all. So the least, what advantage does the leaseholder get from turning up to the court? Well, probably not very much. Um, the fines probably aren't punitive. The fines probably only a couple of pence on each occasion. So a leaseholder who holds quite a lot of land, well, there's no real reason for them to turn up. Many leaseholders could be um, property, property speculators from the local town, so they're certainly not going to turn up. They'd much rather pay the fine. Um, but then again, some leaseholders could be very small leaseholders who are perhaps younger sons who are doing a combination of leaseholding and wage labour, in which case that the financial loss is a greater hit to them. So really, it, it depends on the status of the leaseholder, I would say. Um, but yeah, the, 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 the leaseholder who's a property speculator, much less likely to attend. The leaseholder who's a, a, a minor... <laughs> Um, landholder principally engaged in wage, like wage labour, but much more likely to attend. Excellent. And then uh, Rhiannon Lloyd has said in your talk, you mentioned that there are certain court officers were chosen on rotation. Yes. Would it be usual for a bailiff to serve in the office for many years? Um, she's a genealogist working with a client whose ancestor mm -hmm. seems to have held that office in the Somerset Manor of Lincoln and Whitcomb. Okay. Yeah. Bailiff is well as a bailiff is much more likely to be a salaried officer. Uh, so a bailiff is is much less likely to operate on rotation. Um, there's some something that it's not inconceivable that they could be a tenant of the manor who serves once every fifteen years or so. But it's very unlikely that bailiffs usually salaried officer like the steward are uh, brought in by the lord of the manor to get all the jobs done that he wants to have done as um, um, by somebody who can't do it part time, really. That to, job, jobs like a Haywood or a Reeve, you maybe would put in, I don't know, maybe sort of seven to 10 hours a week, uh, <laughs> conceivably, um, maybe more at harvest time. A Haywood is essentially a harvest officer. Um, you might get some remuneration for it. So you might get, um, an area of the land within the manor which is called the Reeves Acre or the Haywoods Acre that gets given to them as remuneration for the office. But a bailiff is much more likely to be somebody who's planted in there by the Lord of the Manor um, and who uh, and, and who serves for a term of years. Wow. 
Sounds like a very important job. <laughs> yeah, 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 probably. Um, yeah, a reasonable salary. Uh, probably literate as well, so, yeah, well to some degree. That sounds incredible. And yeah. then Jennifer Southernwood has said, my village in Norfolk was divided between six landholders mm -hmm. after the conquest. Would this have merged into fewer manors over the time? Very likely, yes. Um, there is a general process of consolidation that takes place in manors. Uh, in uh, probably in the 13th century, and then another phase of consolidation that takes place probably in the 15th century. A bit hazy on the dates because I'm sure it happens in different places at different times. In Dorset, um, I know one of the manors, well, if, if I two of the manors that I quoted earlier, Durwiston is actually a manor called Durwiston Cum Knighton, that's Latin Cum for weed. Uh, so Durbiston with Knighton started out as two separate manors in the, the or by the 13th century. By the 16th century, merged into one. Lichit Minster is Lichit Minster cum beer, Lichit Minster with beer. And again, they had merged together um, by the 16th century. So quite conceivable that your um, doomsday manners have merged altered and changed by the time you get a, a written record of them from the 14th century yeah, so absolutely. So my um, area, so I'm from the East Midlands area, and mm -hmm. I know that slightly further north in Nottinghamshire is the Dukeries area. Mm -hmm. So I always wonder whether there was those overlaps there. So it's nice to see that it's not just my neck of the woods mm -hmm. that potentially has that yeah. um, going on. Um, and then Brian Phillips has said, and apologies, first of all, if I'm mispronouncing anyone's names, um, hopefully I'm doing okay. Um, hi, Mark. Thanks yeah. for the talk. You're welcome. <laughs> um, much different additional information to your book. Uh, what's the involvement of Victoria County history with manorial records today? So, for example, in Wiltshire, mm. yep. any idea if the BCH is working on Dorset? Mm -hmm. And he is from Milton Abbas Local History Group. A very active local history group, Milton Abbas. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, the Victoria County history produces standard manorial descents and works on manorial documents and, and aims to produce a standard description of every manor across the country. Um, Victoria County history funding isn't um, as forthcoming as it was 20 years ago. Uh, generally, uh, Victoria County history was funded partially by local authorities and local authorities have other pressures at the moment. Um, Wilshire is being finished by money raised locally by local volunteer groups. Um, I don't know if that would be something that would be particularly easy to start on another county because Wiltshire was um, sort of four-fifths complete uh, when the local authority funding uh, stopped. The, the, it, it was probably possible with the setup to finish it off. But there are several active Victoria County history counties. Gloucestershire is active. Somerset, uh, Essex, Staffordshire, um, there are probably others as well. And um, yeah, so uh, yeah, it, it, it will be the aim of the Victoria County History Series to cover every county apart from North Hunt, uh, North, Northumberland. Okay. Uh, because Northumberland already had a um, County History Series. So, uh -huh. But every other county in theory at some stage should get a Victoria County History it might be a very, very, very long time. Absolutely, and that's something we actually had in a webinar recently um, where we learnt a bit more about Victoria County history and how to get involved. So everyone at home, uh, this is not a plug for them, but if you do want to get involved in that research, definitely check out their social media platforms and uh, potentially help them to make these lovely little red books that we all know and love as local historians Great. come to, to life. I say little, they are <laughs> quite significant. Um, and yeah, um, so also just to give everyone an idea, I know that our programming says 12.45. The AGM is currently overrunning. Hopefully those of you who are trying to live stream on the AGM have done so. Um, and Katie and Chris have been very active in the chat with helping you, so thank you again. And then Miranda Lawrence Owen has said again, I work in the Duchy of Cornwall Manors with a colleague. We are wondering if Duchy Manor courts and rules were much less likely to change and develop than uh, non Duchy Manors. I think the short answer to that is probably yes. Um, it's nice to be able to give a short answer, which is yes, <laughs> isn't it? I've looked at two um, Duchy of Cornwall Manors. I've looked at Mere in Wiltshire and I've looked at Fordington in Dorset. Um, and yeah, I'd say they're 
pretty conservative, really. They've certainly got large numbers of copyhold tenants right into the end of the 19th century. Um, their rentals, their surveys, their, um, their, their division of fields, they're much more likely to have uh, open fields for the longer resisting enclosure. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think from, from my own experience of two Duchy of Cornwall manors, I would say super conservative, super conservative. Yep. Excellent. And also thank you to Miranda there for giving Mark a, a short um, answer for his question. <laughs> um, I'm very conscious that you've been talking for well over an hour now. <laughs> um, and then Keith Woolley has said, can customary tenants make raise mortgages on the basis of their tenancy? Um, not something that I've looked at. Um, I would expect that they can. Um, I wouldn't expect that it's necessarily called a mortgage, though. Um, so I'm uh, floundering a bit there, really, because I, I mean it really isn't something that I've looked at. Um, but I, if you expect to say, okay, if somebody has land as security and that land is held for a defined period of time and it's it's held as your capital then i don't see any reason why you shouldn't be able to raise some kind of loan upon it um yeah i'm sure you can i'm sure you can and i'm sure i've seen examples of it that i just can't bring to mind at the moment that we've been talking for two hours it's been <laughs> but, a very long time i'm very impressed still. But, but 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 i think I, I i think the short answer to that is yes but it's not necessarily going to be termed a mortgage okay so those are all of the questions in the Q&A. If anyone does have any last minute ones, um, then please do feel free to pop those in the chat. But I have a question that's slightly less highbrow than these wonderful questions that we've been having. And um, something I always like to ask local historians is mm. what got you into that particular topic that you've been talking about for the last two hours? What got me into manorial history? Uh, well, because I'm from London, I'd always refer to the area that I grew up in as my manor. I just always called it my manor. And, um, and if I was going to somewhere that I didn't really know, it was out of the manor. <laughs> and, and so when I came to university, I started studying manorial history. I, my, my tutor, Clive Birch, found it really funny that I'd refer to my, my home area as my manor. Um, and then when I came to look at um, medieval history more seriously as a postgraduate, I remember uh, looking at a manor court role and more or less the first one, and I hadn't been learning Latin for very long, and, and I looked at a medical and I was looking straight, trying to work out what was going on. And I discovered an entry where it said, John Coke struck John Ladd's pig and broke its tibia. He's fined four pounds. I thought, well, fantastic. That's reaching a level of history. That's reaching into a society that I wouldn't find out about in any other way. That these records are going to tell me about what's going on in local communities across the country in a way that no other records can and so yeah so that's principally why i study manorial history that's so interesting because i find the exact same so i know i keep going on about, on about this to our online audience so apologies for talking about it throughout the day um but my phd research is looking at the commemoration and care of first world war dead in the united okay. kingdom yeah. and some of the records that i'm looking at is inquiries files and letters that we're receiving from the families mm -hmm. and again they're very similar in the style of those manorial records where anywhere else those pieces of ephemera might be lost um and you might not be able to find the similar degree of information there so to see the manorial records acting in a very similar way it's so lovely to find all of these different documents that you can look at as a local historian because for a start we all love the archives don't we, we do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. going in and feeling like indiana yeah. jones or someone like that and discovering these records that might mm -hmm. not have ever been seen for hundreds of years and things um and so it's really wonderful to to look at that through the lens of what's going on and the pig with the tibia is a very funny one for me as well absolutely yeah. <laughs> but, but 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 almost certainly nobody had read that since it was written five six hundred years ago and and that's very often the case with these minority that you really are you know in virgin territory that this is looking at material that nobody has used nobody has seen nobody has and certainly nobody has analyzed for hundreds of years and so yeah, I mean, it's the opportunity for a unique study. There's always the opportunity to discover something that's interesting, groundbreaking, original, 
different that nobody's seen. So, yeah, why not? You know, why, why, why rework something that people have been looking at for years when you could be looking at something that nobody's ever looked at before? And I know we're incredibly biased here at BALH towards this, but local historians are doing that groundbreaking research. Mm, absolutely. And, you know, learning on social media, I've, I've become more of a generalist in my history because I think it's quite common when you are in different fields to yeah. really narrow down your research. So now, I learn so much niche history from our local historians and now when I go to these villages and things I can think oh I remember someone tweeted about that memorial document yeah. or again to shout out Pam uh, who live tweeted your wonderful talk earlier yeah. talking about Rillington and her connections to there through her genealogical research mm -hmm. and so you know local historians really I think sometimes underestimate how important they are to history. Yeah, yeah absolutely and, and I think that that plays out through people perhaps starting looking at parish registers, looking at censuses, looking at tithe records. And then maybe the manorial documents are a, a, a stage on from that, that you can, you, know, you can cut your teeth getting the handwriting from the parish records and doing the analysis from the census and mixing the different sorts of records together by looking at the earliest census and comparing it with the tithe map. And then you overlay the manorial records on top of that. And it's just another set of records the overlay and just give you a wider, broader picture of the whole community. Definitely. And I suppose my other question for you is what's next for your research? Because I know that you are very busy with lots of different things. <laughs> the big question. <laughs> oh, I am, and I, I just keep finding more. And that's the problem. You know, the more records you look at, the more things you find that uh, you want to look at, and the more uh, things that you find. The, 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 the next memorial piece of work that I want to do is to look at the court's elite in Dorset mm -hmm. and the hundred courts in Dorset. And the hundred court is a, a tier above, the, um, oh, it's a tier that runs in parallel or above the court lead. And to, to look at the relationship between the hundred court and the court lead uh, and how they interact in the 16th, 17th, 18th centuries and the types of cases that are brought to each court and in those hundreds, well, the court, the curia legalis takes all of that business and the, the legal court of the hundred means that there's no court leaks within that hundred. All of the business is brought to the hundred court. That happens, for instance, at the mayor in Wiltshire. Um, whether there's a difference in the cases that are brought and what's happening than, say, a uh, hundred like Badbury hundred in uh, Dorset, where half the matters go to the hundred court as their legal court, and half the matters go to a court that um, held on on the matters themselves. And and does that make a, a, a qualitative or a quantitative difference in the type of cases that are brought to different courts? Gosh, that sounds amazing. And yeah, definitely follows on from your wonderful guidebook for it, us as well. It's a lot of number crunching. But, 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 but there should be some fun stuff in it too. I bet your spreadsheet <laughs> looks absolutely terrifying for that number. <laughs> We've all been there as local historians looking at number crunching and those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, again, a reminder, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or in the Q&A section. Um, and we can do that. Um, I think we're just about to potentially go back to the AGM. No, sorry, I'm looking away from you uh, and just seeing what's going on. Um, and in terms of the guidebook, how do you um, kind of go about that research? Because obviously it's going to a slightly different audience sometimes. Yeah, uh, that was quite tricky because that was in lockdown. And what I originally intended to do, and Helen, my colleague who, uh, who co-produced it with me, uh, we'd, we'd intended to go around to a lot of different archives and sample a lot of different uh, records and uh, we were very lucky that many of the archives that had more recently uh, contributed uh, their information to the Manorial Document Register had uh, done outreach programs around that and so they were able to send us some documents that they'd used in their outreach programs and some summaries of what they found in completing the Manorial Documents Register and so we had a, a reasonable amount of material from across the country because I mean, I'm based in Dorset, Helen was based in York, and there was only a certain amount that we could gather locally. Um, fortunately, it turns out the Wakefield Court Roll series and the Manchester Court Roll being online, fantastic. No, I, I really would say that for anybody who hasn't looked at manorial documents previously, that they contain so many examples. 
the, you know, the, the part of our process was triaging them and so forth. Oh, that's interesting. That happened in Manchester, that happened in Wakefield. And, you know, I know that that happens in Dorset. Helen had worked a lot on Wales and she you know, was able to say, was well, a certain things that happened in Wales. And, 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 and we put it together by our collective knowledge of what we need from other places, but obviously made it a little more difficult by lockdown. But it is the case that there's so much variation between units. And, and so much of what's been published has been based on Essex, Suffolk, and Norfolk and Cambridge. That uh, it's it's quite difficult to get a national picture. And I'm saying, well, if you're working in Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk, and Cambridge, well, that's great because you've got quite a lot of really good examples to compare and contrast against. And so that can help you with your research. If you're in other counties, it means that any count, any study that you do, you can set against a lot of public published material from a different region. And so that means that uh, you've always got that kind of compare and contrast. You're waiting, which, uh, I'm waiting for a cue for the online side of it. It takes you beyond the very, very speaking. local. And, and, and means that you I'm going to get a wave in the minute. So I can go. Definitely. And again, just to yes. you know, go over that with my own research, having digitised records has been so helpful in lockdowns and things. I know it's incredibly uh, a difficult task and a bigger picture than a lot of people see when they are doing their own local history research. Um, so definitely. Um, and now we are finally finished up with the AGM in the other room. Thank you so much to Mark for talking with us for the last two hours <laughs> about manorial records. If you do have any other questions, please just pop them in the chat and we can pass them on to Mark and he can answer them in slow time a little bit. But we're now going to head back to the hall and we're going to be going to the Local History Photographer of the Year Awards. So the theme this year was what does local history mean to you? And we had some wonderful images coming through about local history and a variety that covers across all time periods. Uh, it was a really tough competition. Um, I'm sure that you'll see the images okay. come and be blown Hello, away um, by them. Um, so we're now going to go to the hall and to our outreach lead, Susan Moore, to find out who the winners are. And hopefully some of them are online as well. But thank you again, Mark. You. And uh, you should be able to see Conway Hall's main area just now. And so many people are coming through with thank yous uh, in the chat. Um, and yes, we're just going to see if we can get into the main hall for that live stream there. So I'm just looking behind the camera. So thank you.